we are back at reading this book by Keel. Why the UFOs Why UFOs Operation Trojan Course by John A. Keel. There is not a plot to cover up the truth, but a sensible decision made by men whose minds have been boggled by just a glimpse of the overwhelming reality they encountered in their search for evidence to prove or disprove the existence of UFOs. <clears throat> yes, in this wonderful Fortean dream that we all live in. So we are now in chapter five, the Grand Deception. Let's see if we get this right. I, they say you're supposed to peek right into this where it says blue on my Yeti. I don't like, don't like the stand part of it. But what you guess you can't complain. I got a used one for $44 instead of the 150 that they wanted for a brand new one. Oh, we knew from 120, 150. So. Grand, the Grand Deception. The secret of flying saucers was exposed in 1896, not by the phenomenon itself, but by the hidden patterns now revealed in UFO activity of a single week that November. The pattern was a classic of carefully planned confusion and deception. Uh, Thanksgiving week, 1896, marked the beginning of the great, quote, airship mystery, end of quote, in the United States. Strange and luminous objects and cigar-shaped uh, craft were first reported over California. The mayors of both Oakland and San Francisco were on record as having seen the things. All the descriptions as published by the San, Fr San Francisco Call and the San Francisco Chronicle and other leading journals of the period fell into the now familiar categories. Brilliant multicolored lights uh, bobbing and weaving as if they were uh, on yo-yo strings and were seen over Sacramento. People in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oakland, Sorry about this. People in Oakland reported an egg-shaped vessel about 150 feet long with four uh, rotor-like arms. Huh. Yeah. A, gr a great light mounted underneath it lit up the ground below. In San Jose, um, California, electrician named J.A. Heron claimed that the airship pilots enlisted him to make some repairs on the machine. He was taken to a desolate field north of San Francisco uh -huh, for the job and was rewarded by being taken on a flight to, to Hawaii. He said that the craft made the 4,400-mile trip in 24 hours. Later, his wife told reporters that he had been home in bed on the night of the alleged trip. Another man, William Bull Meek of Comptonville, California, uh, told reporters that the airship landed near his home and that he enjoyed a brief chat with the, uh, with the pilot. A bearded man who told him that the ship had come from Montezuma Mountains. Come from the Montezuma Mountains. Crews on the ship were seeing glowing spheres and saucer-shaped machines that are rising out of the water and flying away while the Wright brothers were still f fussing with gliders. And there, these ocean bound discs and wheels apparently concentrated their activities around the oceans of Japan and China throughout the gay 90s, um, but they were also seen in Europe, 
News traveled slowly in those days, so it was unlikely that the witnesses in one area had ever heard of the identical sightings that had occurred thousands of miles away. As it is still the case today, no newspaper or journalist made an effort to collect all these reports and collate them into a whole. In March and April of 1897, the airship reports began to spread across the country but seemed to concentrate in the Midwest from Texas to Michigan, the same area which still accounts for the largest number of reports. We are indebted by Dr. Jacques Vallée and Mrs. Lucius uh, Farish, Farish? Uh, Charles Ford and Mr. Jer Jerome Clark, who have spent many tedious hours examining dusty newspaper files and microfilm collections throughout the country in their search for the pub published accounts of the 1890 uh, flap. They have unearthed hundreds of forgotten reports, many of them quite startling in content. A study of these reports reveals that the same pattern that seems to be present today. Many of the local newspapers assumed that only one airship was involved and that it was the product of some secret inventor who was taking it out for a trial run across the country, but we find that many of the airship sightings took place on the same day in dozens of widely scattered areas, indicating that the whole armada of these objects must have been in the air at that time. At the time. Did I say at that? I said at that time. Quite a few of these accounts are as incredible as the reports of modern witnesses. Yet many of the 1897 witnesses were distinguished members of their communities and often signed sworn affidavits to take up their beliefs in a way they had seen. And what they had seen. When I say way, I keep making up words. There uh, were a number of remarkable consistencies in, that, in the reports and many detailed contactee stories. Judge Lawrence A. Bryan was, uh, to quote, a, a reporter for the uh, Daily Texarkanian, Texarkanian, Texarkanian Arca Arkansas, uh, known here for his truthfulness by his fellow men. On April 25, 1897, that paper published this amazing story. I was down on McKinney Bio Friday looking after uh, the surveying of a tract of land and in passing through the thickest to an open space saw a strange looking object anchored to the ground. On approaching, I found it to be an airship. I have read so much about of late, of late. It was manned by three men who spoke a foreign language, but judging from their looks, would take them to be Japs. They saw my astonishment and beckoned me to follow them. On complying, I was shown through the ship. The judge then explained about the machinery being made of aluminum and the gas to rise and lower the monster was pumped into the aluminum tank when the ship was to be raised and let out when it was lowered. There is no further description of, in the account. Most interesting thing about this, this story is that the judge mistook the pilots for Japanese, perhaps meaning that they were small men 
with oriental features similar to the men described in controversial modern context stories of Betty and Barney Hill. Uh, can we assume that Judge Bryan was a reliable, responsible witness? One yellowing newspaper clipping doesn't offer much evidence, but he is was not the only in 1897 contact tale. There were scores of others, although no one else reported meeting Japs. Most of the people who claimed to glimpse the airship pilots described them as being bearded. Michigan had, was very much involved in, 18, in the 1897 flap and the Courier Herald of uh, Saginaw uh, followed the report closely. On April 16th, it ran this story. Bell Plains, Iowa, April 16th, the citizens of Len Grove declared there is no longer any doubt among them of the existence of an airship. Yesterday morning, a large object was seen slowly moving in the heavens in a northerly direction and seemed to be making preparations to alight. James Evans, liveryman, FGLS, harness dealer, uh, har harness dealer, excuse me, Ben. Bolin, Stock Deliverer, David Evans, and Joe uh, Kruks Kruksky jumped into a rig and started in pursuit. They found the airship had a line four miles north of town. I uh, say a line, a lighted, had alighted four miles north of town and when within 700 yards it spread its four monstrous wings and flew off towards the north. Its occupants threw out two large boulders of unknown composition which were taken to the village and are now on an exhibition. There were two query looking, two queer looking persons on board who made desperate attempts to conceal themselves. Evan, uh, Evans and Krokski Krok uh, say they had the largest whisker, whisker they had ever seen in their lives. Nearly every citizen in Lynn Grove saw the airship as it sailed over the town and the excitement is intense. Argus, the Argus leader of uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, together with many other people, ran an account on April 15, day, day lined Springfield, Iowa, Illinois, excuse me. Two farmhands, Adolf Winkle and John Hall, signed affidavits stating that. The airship had landed two miles outside of Springfield to repair some electrical apparatus on board. The farmhand said they talked to the occupants, two men and a woman. They were told that the machine had flown to Springfield from Quincy, a distance about 100 miles, and 30 minutes and would make a report to the government uh, when Cuba is declared free. <laughs> Two lawmen, Constable John and J. Uh, um, Sumter Jr. and Deputy Sheriff John McLormore of Garland County, Arkansas, signed affidavits on May 8, 1897, testifying that they had also conversed with the airship occupants. Their account was published in Helena, Arkansas Weekly uh, World and on May 13th. Yeah. Take a little break. All right. 
two lawmen, Constable John J. Sumter Jr. and Deputy Sheriff John McLemore of Garland County, Arkansas, signed affidavits on uh, May 8, 1897, testifying that they had also conversed with the airship occupants. Their account was published in the Helena, Arkansas Weekly World on May 13. While riding northwest from the city on the night of May 6, 1897, we noticed a brilliant light high in the heavens. Suddenly, it disappeared and we said nothing about it. As we were looking for parties and did not want to make any noise, after riding four or five miles around through the hills, we again saw the, the light, which now appeared to be much nearer the earth. We stopped our horses and watched it coming down until all at once it disappeared behind another hill. We rode on about a half a mile further when our horses refused to go further. About a hundred yards distant, we saw two persons moving around with lights, drawing our Winchesters, for we were now thoroughly aroused to the importance of the situation. We demanded, who is that? What are you doing? A man with a long dark beard came forth with a lantern in his hand and on being informed who we were proceeded to tell us that he and the others, a young man and woman, were traveling through the country in an airship. We could plainly distinguish the outlines of the vessel which was cigar shape and about 60 feet long and looking just like the cuts that have appeared in uh, the papers recently. <clears throat> it was dark and raining and the young man was filling a big sack with water about 30 yards away and the woman was particular and particular to keep back in the dark. She was holding an umbrella over her head. The man with the whiskers invited us to take a ride, saying that he could take us where it was not raining. We told him we preferred to get wet. Asking the man why and the brilliant light was turned on and off so much, he replied that the light was so powerful that it consumed a great deal uh, of his motive power. He said that it would, he said, let me try this, he said he would like to stop off in hot springs for a few days and take a hot, a hot bath, but his time was limited and he could not. He said they were going to wind up in Nashville, Tennessee after thoroughly seeing the country. Being in a hurry, he left and upon our return, about 40 minutes later, nothing was to be seen. We didn't hear or see the airship when it departed. Signed, John J. Sumter Jr. and John McLemore. Scribed and sworn to before me on the 8th of the day of May of 1897. C. G. Bush, J.P.
<clears throat> See if we can expand this a little bit so I can read it better. As the airship sightings increased, uh, another familiar phase began. The explainers and hoaxers moved in. Professor George Hugh of Northwest Western University blamed Venus at first, but later he said, quote, Alpha Orionis has been rooming uh, through its regular course in the firmament 10 miles, 10 million years. Um, why it should have been settled upon in the last three weeks and pointed out as the headlight of his mysterious aerial vehicle is hard to explain. Chicago Tribune, April 11, 1897. An electrician named A.H. Badcock <laughs> uh, built a, a large box kit and sent it skyward on November uh, 28, 26, 1896 over Oklahoma, California, setting off a new rash of airship reports there. The San Francisco, California Chronicle, uh, November 27, 1896. The paper balloon filled with gas entertained others all over the country. Quote, Anything from Jupiter to the moon was picked out as an airship by credulous people, unquote. The Portland, Oregon, Oregonian observed on November 25, uh, 1896. Quote, early in the evening, a fire balloon went sailing through the air, and the newspapers were overwhelmed by telephone messages from people in various parts of, of the city who thought they had discovered the mysterious airship, in quotes. Newspapers that weren't receiving any reports uh, bleakly uh, made up some to fill the gap. Hudson Gazette at Hudson, Michigan, ran a long piece which quoted every prominent citizen in the town. Quote, and it was quite a bit larger than the Republican majority in Houston, in quote, said Plim Gilman. When the editor of the Adrian Michigan Weekly Times an expositor received his copy of the Gazette. He ordered his Hudson correspondents to look into the matter. And by the way, Adrian is about 15, 20 minutes where, where, from where I live. From where I live. Um, on April 17th, the Weekly Times and expositor printed with relish, no doubt. The sensational report of the airship having been seen by many Republican, excuse me, reputable, reputable uh, citizens of this place turns out to be a huge fake. Hudson did not propose to be behind the times, so one of our enterprising editors set his imagination to work and produce a half, half a column sensation the airship is very likely as f f uh, filmy as the aforesaid article more bizarre explanations were offered too this is so true we see this happening in the bigfoot community and all of this other like cryptid and the paranormal <coughs> community and in the UFO, uh, UF, the ufology community as well so people just make up stuff we have a tendency to do that don't we uh, you know fill in the gaps right mind the gap mind the gap 
discussing uh, the quote uh, moving lights of fire da 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 said to be said to have been seen nightly on Saginaw Bay off Cassville during the past week end quote the Bent Harbor Michigan Evening News noted on April 1st of 1897 that quote the superstitious belief uh, that they are produced by the ghost of those who were lost with the, st- the steamer um, Oconto, which was wrecked on Big Charity Island a few years ago, in a quote. A uh, wheel, unquote, fell out of the sky near Battle Creek, Michigan, and was retrieved by a well-to-do farmer named George Parks. Parks and his wife were crossing a field when they saw, quote, a very bright object that appeared to be about 100 feet from the earth and swiftly approaching, end quote. As it flew low over them, emitting a humming sound, something fell, out, fell to the earth and buried itself in the ground. Mr. Parks reportedly dug it up the next morning and found it to be a large wheel made of aluminum about three feet in diameter and a turbine in shape. In a quote, he kept the object as a memento and displayed it on his farm in Penfield, uh, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan Evening News April 15, uh, 1897. A Mrs. Wingate, Wingate <clears throat> quote, reading just over a, the line of uh, Charleston Township, uh, excuse me, residing just over the line in Charleston Township, quote, was one of the witnesses who reported seeing a brilliant white light around 10 p.m. on the night of March 31. She said that she distinctly heard human voices from above at the time of the occurrence. Detroit Evening News, April 1st. April Fools? April 1st, 1897. Others around the country were also hearing voices in the sky. I saw the airship last night at 10.30 p.m. over my barn, end quote. One uh, Bide Osborne, or Bid Osborne, how do we say, Rid, Bid, Bid, Bid Osborne, uh, wrote uh, to the Lansing, Michigan State Republican, April 17, uh, 1897. Quote, about 800 feet long, Bill, big brute, row of Japanese lanterns all along the top, large wide sail like a fanfell dove, uh, dark bay in color, and I heard voices from above. Sounded like Jim Bar, uh, I guess it's Baird. Uh, and Charlie Bicker, no fake, make affidavit, damn, I can't speak, I read right now, make an affidavit, uh, and a quote, another man uh, near Pine Lake, Michigan, named William May Givron, told the same newspaper that he was awakened by a tap on his window, and to glare and the, the glare that at first blinded him. Republican continues, the Republican continues, on stepping out into the night, he was accosted by a voice above. Accosted? Okay. Which told him that the light was from the airship. That during the afternoon, the ship had been lying concealed behind an a bank of clouds over the lake that a stray shot from a gun 
of some duck hunters had injured one of the ship's wings <clears throat> and they were laying uh, by for repairs. William then said that he was directed to prepare four dozen egg sandwiches and a kettle of coffee for the crew. When prepared, the uh, preventer, preventer was a, a hoisted on board with a scoop fully as large as a freight car and paid for in Canadian quarters. <clears throat> Went further, said that the aerial monster appeared about 300 feet above the lake, but only the outlines were visible on account of the brilliant searchlight, which made everything below as bright as day and above as dark as midnight during the uh, during a cyclone. He observed a red light at each end and thinks the ship was fully half a mile long. All appeals to be taken uh, aboard were met with a uh, merry ha-ha. But William said that he thinks the occupants hailed from either Kentucky or <laughs> Milwaukee as they asked for a corkscrew. Bill said if he knew their address he would have a whole crew arrested for violating the fish law. For the light reflected so strongly on the lake that it was no trouble for occupants to pick out the biggest and best fish in the lake with a long-handled spear. <clears throat> Just before daylight, the ship sailed off towards the city. The whir of the machine uh, was plainly discernible for several moments. It sounds as if a McGivern, McGivern uh, were pulling somebody's leg, or maybe the editor of the Republican was doing it for him. The editor of the Daily uh, Chronicle of Muskegon, Michigan, uh, may have been doing some leg pulling too. With the next item, published on April 30, uh, but there is also a chance that he may have taken a real report and added a few touches. It's difficult to decide. Last night at 1130, uh, this town, Holton, received a visit from a wonderful airship. It came from the north and descended till it was about 200 feet from the ground and directly over the bridge. It was li li lighted with electric electricity and loaded with revelers who were making a good deal of noise. The music was was entrancing, the like of which never was heard in this place. It wasn't long before everybody was on the street uh, to look and listen. Many of their na uh, night clothes, um, many in their night clothes, uh, not a few thought the judgment day had come. It was about 300 feet long. Uh, the tail was about 40 feet. Um, it's uh, its breadth and depth about 90 feet. It stayed at 55 minutes. Its tail commenced whirling and it moved off towards Fremont. But just as it began to move, a grappling hook was let down and caught one of our most tr truthful citizens who was insistently hoisted instantly hoisted on board and carried away. The truthful citizen came back on 1130 
on the 11:30 train from White Cloud, and has been talking ever since about the aerial navigation. Such hoary tales uh, provide comedy relief during the flap. The newspaper generally took the matter lightly when the stories first started to appear, making weary comments about the quality of the whiskey in the flap areas, etc. But as reports poured in and the objects began to appear over the cities where the skeptical newspapers were based, the tone of, of the published reports grew more serious. Something strange was going on and the more responsible newspapers began to wonder what it was really all about. One of the most celebrated cases of the period, the story of Alexander Hamilton's cow, has been widely reprint, reprinted and practically every UFO book ex, extent, uh, ex, extent. And we will therefore just summarize it here. Hamilton claimed that he and his family saw a cigar-shaped object swoop down over his farm near Vern, uh, Vernon, Kansas sometime in the middle of April. It was occupied by six of the strangest beings I ever saw, he declared. They were jabbering together, but we could not understand a syllable they said. He described the object as being 300 feet long with a transparent glass car carriage underneath. It was brilliantly li lighted within and everything was clearly visible. There were three lights and one, one like an immense searchlight and two smaller, one red and the other green. The larger one was suspend, suspend, uh, susceptible of being turned in every direction. Susceptible, susceptible. Okay, every part of the vessel, which was not transparent, was of a bar dark reddish color, and quote great turban wheels about 30 feet in diameter, and a quote, revolved underneath. As his little group watched, the machine began to buzz and rise up. Then it paused directly over a three-year-old heifer, which apparently was caught in the fence. Going to her, Hamilton said, we found a cable about a half an inch in thickness made of some red material fashioned in a slip knot around her neck. <clears throat> One end passing up the into the vessel and tangled in the wire fence. <clears throat> he tried to free the, the calf but couldn't. But he cut the wire and watched helplessly as the ship and the calf rose slowly into the air and sailed away. The next day, the uh, branded hide, hind leg, hind leg um, and head of the animal were found on the property of Lank Thomas, who lived about four miles away. Farmer Hamilton not only signed an affidavit of but he collected the town's most prominent people, citizens, including the local sheriff, the justice of the peace, doctor, and postmaster, and had them all sign a statement testifying that they had known him for from 13, 15 to 30 years, and that for truth and uh, Ferocity, we have uh, never heard his word question, and that we do verily believe his statement to be true and correct. Yates Center, Kansas, Farmers Advocate, 
um, April 23, 1897. Excuse me. This case is significant, not only because of the detailed descriptions and transparencies of the object, but because it was the first of a long line of cattle rustling reports concerning UFOs. The theft and mutilation of dogs, cattle, and horses have become unpleasantly commonplace in flap areas. Texas had more than its share of sightings during the 1890s. Many of them were uh, concentrated in the region where John Martin had reported seeing a flying saucer in 1878. On April 22 of 1897, Mr. John M. Barclay uh, conversed allegedly with a man from an oblong machine, oblong machine with wings and brilliant lights. Quote, which appeared much brighter than electric lights, end of quote. He had been awakened about 11 p.m. by his fiercely barking dog, and when he looked outside, he saw the object hovering stationary about 15 feet above the ground. It circled a few times and landed in a nearby pasture. Barkley grabbed his rifle and went to investigate. When he was about 30 yards from the ship, he was met by an ordinary mortal who asked him to put his gun aside. Who are you? Mr. Barkley asked. Never mind about my name. Call it Smith. The man replied, I want some uh, lubricating oil and a couple of cold uh, chisels. Cold chisels if you can get them. Some blue stone. I suppose I saw mill har hard by has well, that make sense. I suppose I, I suppose the sawmill hard by has the two former articles and the telegraph operator has the bluestone. Here's a ten dollar bill. Take it and get us those articles and keep the change for your trouble. Mr. Barkley reportedly asked him, What have you got down in there? Let me go and see it. No, the man said quickly. We can't permit you to approach any nearer, uh, but do as we request you, and your kindness will be appreciated. And we will uh, call you some future day and reciprocate your kindness by taking you on a trip. End of quote. Barkley located some oil and, and chisels, but he couldn't get the blue stone. He returned and tried to give the man back the $10 bill, but it was refused. Quote, Smith, quote, took, uh, shook hands with the Texan, thanking him and asked him not to uh, follow him to the object. Barkley asked him where he was from and where he was going. From anywhere, Smith answered. But we will be in Greece the day after tomorrow. <clears throat> he climbed aboard the object, and there was a whirling noise. It was gone like a shot. According to Barkley, the newspapers in Rockland, Texas, said that he was perfectly reliable. In quotes. That same night, quote, a prominent farmer, quote, near uh, Justin Red, I guess it was Red, Texas, also had a confrontation with an airship, with the airship pilots. Mr. Frank Nichols claimed that he was awakened around midnight by the whirling of machinery. Quote, upon looking out, he was startled upon beholding brilliant lights steaming from a ponderous vessel of strange proportions, which rested upon the ground 
and his cornfield, end of quote. Like Barkley, he went outside to investigate. Before he had gotten very far, he was met by two men with uh, buckets who asked for permission to draw water from his well. He told them to go ahead and they invited him to visit their ship. There he saw he conversed freely. There he said he conversed freely with six or, or eight individuals and apparently was shown the machinery which, quote, was so complicated that he, that in his short interview he could gain no knowledge of its workings, end of quote. Nichols said that they told him that, quote, five of th these ships were built in a small town in Iowa, and, sh and soon the invention will be given to the public. An immense sh a stock company is now being formed, and within the next year, the machines will be in general use, end of quote. The motive of power was supposedly, quote, condensed electricity, end of quote. Mr. Nichols, the newspaper said, was, quote, a man of unquestionable uh, veracity, end of quote. This invention story spreads as you will see and appears to support the possibility of an unexpected hoax. But before we explore the hoax question, there are two more contact cases that deserve examination. An apparently well-known and highly reputable man identified as ex-Senator Harris, in quotes, said that he had been awakened at 1 a.m. Wednesday, April 21st, 1897, by a strange noise, and he was astonished to see the celebrated air ship descending on his property outside of Harrisburg, Arkansas. He stepped outside and was met by the craft's occupants, conversing with them as they busied themselves, quote, taking on a supply of fresh well water, end of quote. Uh, Senator Harris said there were two young men and a woman and an elderly man on board. The old gentleman, in quotes, the senator is quoted as saying, Harrisburg, Arkansas, uh, Modern News, April 23, 1897, quote, wore a heavy set of black silken whiskers which hung down near his waist. He had just, he had jet black eyes and a deep smir, firm, not smirm, firm expression, in a quote. Whereas the airship occupants and did not seem especially informative in the other contact cases of the period, this elderly gentleman talked his head off he seemed to be familiar with the newspapers in St. Louis, Missouri, and referred to a story which had appeared in the St. Louis Republican about 26 years ago. Here's the way the Senator Harris quoted him. <clears throat> in that newspaper, there was an account of a scientific invention uh, made by a gentleman whose name I will not mention, by which the laws of gravitation were entirely and completely suspended. He was offered big sums of money for it by several syndicates in this country and also had large offers uh, from Paris, London and many other places. During the time he was considering offers he had the invention secretly locked in a safely de safety deposit vault in New York City. Before he had accepted any of the offers, he was taken violently ill, and after lingering a few weeks died, leaving his invention in the vault. This man was my uncle, and he had 
uh, partially confided the secret to me, but not sufficiently for me to do anything without the original invention. After a lapse of about 19 years, I managed to secure the original and having plenty of money at my disposal and having devoted my time and talent during the past seven years to experimenting. I have an airship which is almost perfection, but I am not quite through experimenting and so I, I continue to travel at night to keep from being detected. I will make an attempt to visit the planet Mars before I put the airship on, on public expedi ex 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 exhibition. <clears throat> exhibition. The weight is a, no object to me. I suspend all gravitation by placing a small wire around an object. You see, I have a four ton improved Huckus gun on board besides about 10 tons of ammunition I have, I have making preparation to go over to Cuba and kill off the Spanish army if hostilities had not ceased but now my plans are changed and I may go to aid go to the aid of uh, Armenians <coughs> to use this improved gun we only have to pour the cartridge into a hopper and press a button and it fires 60,000 times per minute. Sure. No. <laughs> no gravitation is uh, not in my way. Uh, I place my wire around this four ton gun and hold it with one hand and take aim. Oh, I could place my anti-gravitation wire around the National Capitol building and take it by the dome and bring it over and set it down in Harrisburg as easy as I could and ink stand. Distance is almost overcome. Why? We came over the suburbs of Dallas at 1210 less than an hour ago and we have traveled very slowly I could take breakfast here I do my shopping in Paris and be back here for dinner without inconvenience as soon as I get my new propellers completed he offered Senator Harris a ride in the craft but Harris declined. <clears throat> so the man in the crew of the three climbed of three climbed back aboard and the object and the object rose into the night. Now this whole tale sounds like another editorial concoction. There has never been any kind of gun that could fire sixty thousand times per minute and all the talk of about anti gravity smells of a put on yet the story contains some interesting ingredients the inter interjection of uh, the Cuban crisis that then existed and which later led to the Spanish-American War and the mention of the Armenians who were being who were then being slaughtered by the Turks falls into familiar patterns found in all contactee stories, i.e. the total awareness of the contemporary events. And if the story isn't a fabrication, then the bearded man chose either by accident or design a first-rate witness to tell it to. An ex-senator, well, that doesn't mean he's, just because he's a senator doesn't mean he's an honest man. That's, we know that for a fact, don't we? In the story he had carefully planted the important points that the airship was a secret terrestrial invention that would soon be made public. Other contactees in the area, other areas were repeating the same thing. Our final contactee is 
that well-known Iron Mountain Railroad conductor, the uh, re redoubtable uh, Captain James Houghton, who claimed to have seen the airship, talked to m men aboard it, and who drew an a elaborate sketch from for the newspapers, which showed a cigar-shaped vehicle covered with uh, <clears throat> vanes, wings, and pro propellers. <clears throat> Quote, those who know Mr. Hooten will vouch for the truth of his statement, end of quote. Arcus and Cassette, and April 22, 1897, noted, it seemed that Captain Hooten was hunting near Homan, um, Arkansas. No date is given for the instant when he heard a familiar sound, quote, a sound for all the world like the workings of an air pump on a locomotive, end of quote. He walked in the direction of the sound and came upon an open field containing a magnificent airship. <clears throat> there was a medium-sized looking man aboard and I noticed that he was wearing smoke glasses, sunglasses. He was tinkering around what seemed to be the back end of a ship and as I approached I was too dumbfounded to speak. He looked at me in, for, uh, in surprise and said, Good day, sir, good day. I asked, Is this the airship? And he replied, Yes, sir. Whereupon three or four other men came out of what was apparently the keel of the ship. A close examination showed that the keel was divided into two parts terminating in front like the sh sharp edge of a knife. In fact, the entire front end of the ship terminated in a knife-like edge, while the sides of the ship bulged gradually towards the middle and then receded. There were three large wheels upon which upon each side made of some bending metal and arranged so that they became concave as they moved forward. I beg pardon, I beg pardon, sir, in quotes. I said, quote, the noise sounds a, a good deal like a Westinghouse air brake, end quote. Perhaps it does, my friend. We are uh, using condensed air and Aerial planes, aerial planes, but you will know more later on. Already, sir, in quotes, someone called out. And then the party all disappeared b below. I observed that just in front of each wheel, a two inch tube began to spurt air on the wheels and they commenced revolving. The ship gradually rose with a hissing sound, the aeroplane's wings suddenly sprang forward, turning their um, sharp edges skyward. Then the rudders at the end of the ship began to veer to one side and the wheels revolves so fast that one could scarcely see the blades. In less time than it, ta is, it takes to tell you, the ship had gone out of sight. There are many fascinating details in Captain Houghton's narrative. Again and again, the modern contactee stories, we are told that UFO occupants wear goggles and ordinary sunglasses or ordinary sunglasses perhaps to hide distinctive oriental eyes. Houghton was apparently told very little except that he would quote no more later on in a quote. His description of the craft makes it sound like 
a uh, Rube Goldberg's uh, contraption, but rotating discs have been described on modern UFOs too. And some equally strange looking objects have apparently been sighted. Enough of these reports have now been uncovered so that we can safely assume that some of these airships did land and that at least bearded men were aboard them. Uh, some researchers point to 1897 as proof that we were being visited by Martians and Venetians at the time. This not only seems unlikely, in the view of these stories it seems impossible. No, there has to be another answer to all of this. Analysis of 1897 flap. Working purely from newspaper accounts is not easy, particularly since the standards of journalism in 1897 left much to be desired, as it does in 2023. Uh, but we weeded out 126 accounts which seemed reliable named witnesses and appeared to be responsibly written. Um, all of these sample cases were reported in April 1897 and came from 14 states. Actually, the spring flap began in March in several states and tapered off in May. There were mass sightings in Omaha, Nebraska in March, and in April an airship passed directly over Chicago, Illinois, and was reportedly viewed by thousands. A few days after that sighting in April 9 in Chicago, papers had carried articles uh, ridiculing the reports th that were coming in from other sections of the country. May maybe the bearded, quote, inventor, unquote, decided to put on a show for the skeptical Chicago Chicagoans. 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 Is that how you pronounce it? In my outline, of the flap of March 8, 1967, um, in Chapter 1 of this book, you will note that case number 16 was reported in Eldorado, Illinois. A small town of about 3,000 souls smacked in the middle of Iowa. On April 9, 1897, they also had a sightings in this unlikely place. In fact, if we compare the 1897 flap with the things that are going on now, and, and <clears throat> like I'm assuming this would be 18, nine, 1867, or that time period, right? Um, we find that the sightings have been concentrated in many specific areas more for many years. The area around Dallas, Texas is one. Michigan is another. There was a well-publicized flap in Michigan in March of 1966 around Ann Arbor and Hillsdale. And my son's mother well, my son and his mother have a, a cottage there in Hillsdale. That's so close I am to us in Ann Arbor. Uh, there were sightings in Ann Arbor on April 17th in 1897. Michigan had, in fact, 30.5% of all the sightings used in our 1897 study. So basically one-third of all the sightings that were happened in Michigan. Hmm. There is still constant UFO activities in that state despite the dearth of publicity. In 1897, when people saw actual objects, they des described them as being cigar-shaped and being large dark forms with lights attached. No flying saucers are turned up in the reports 
I have collected. But the nighttime observations then were exactly the same as they are now. Brightly lights with a colored lights flashing around them, often moving in an erratic fashion, but apparently controlled. It is possible that the airship was nothing more than a decoy, a cover for the real activity that was taking place in 1897. Certainly, these objects did not consist of one or two clumsy balloons shuffling across the country. <clears throat> On the night of Saturday, April 17, 1897, alone there were reported sightings in seven scattered towns and cities in Michigan. The same night, 12 towns in Texas far, far from Michigan, had sightings, as did Waterloo, Iowa, in St. Louis, Missouri. <clears throat> there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people involved in some of these sightings. We cannot dismiss them all, nor can we explain them. Texas had more than 20% of all the sightings in 1897, and the state has had continuous sightings for the past 20 years. Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, D.C. had sightings in April 15, 1897. I, the military could be involved in all this, too, back in 1897. I mean, my God. And the government. About 25% of all of... The 1897 sightings occurred at approximately 9 p.m., 20% in 8 p.m., and 20% at 10 p.m., and 15% at midnight. Others were scattered in the early morning hours. Most of the reported landing took place at 12 p.m. or later. This time pattern still holds true today. Obviously, the great 1897 flap had much in common with the sightings in 1968. In short, nothing much has changed. The important thing in all this is, in my book, now speaking for myself, Michael Adams, Old Religion Dystopia, The Lord of Ord, is this time period between 8 and 10. If you're going to film orbs or objects in the sky, it seems like maybe the best time. I wonder why that is. Is that be, or is my assumption um, erroneous? Well, the only way to find out is for everybody to start filming stuff up in the sky and in the air. Find out. It might be a giant. You know, either way, it's not going to be a waste of time if we work together on this. This is not me speaking. And that is, you know, if we all did this um, in different areas of the country and, and discipline ourselves and, and deal with the disappointment and a lot of um, nothing that you'll be filming, um, yeah, still we can start to gather some data. At least we'll find out that there's, there's not much to support any of this or there is something that's going on that's maybe we're going in the wrong direction about, right? Just something I felt like saying. Obviously, the great uh, blah 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 blah. We have n no way of knowing how many sightings went unreported and how many published reports have been lost or still remain undiscovered. New ones are coming to light all the time. Each new flap since 1964 seems to have begun somewhere in the Midwest. And those mysterious, mysteriously favored states and spread out from there. Of course, since the activities seemed to cluster in more thinly populated areas, the reports are reduced to an unsatisfactory trickle. Despite all the collections, uh, descriptions of lights and wheels in the sky, we suffer from real from a real shortage of geographical data and are only just now beginning to learn how to properly analyze what little hard data is available. And it seems like, now this is 
published in, two, in 1970. So we're talking uh, 53 years, 54 years, 55 years in that time period, and it's still the same situation, which at this point suggests to me the meddling hands of um, corporate the corporate military industrial complex involved in a lot of this and the mass media which is connected with the government which is the military industrial complex is all serving the oligarchs and they're using it all they weaponized against us and um so but the saying that you know and let's talk about 1970 there's no reason to assume that there wasn't some form of um advanced balloon technology or the beginnings or e e uh, phases or even been around for even longer to realize of drone technology and um if we look at the balloon technology and satellites and how you know even in the 1990s and then even at that time they were to be able to sustain or have balloons in the upper atmosphere for great amounts of time and now they're saying that they can be there for decades that's what they say i mean i don't know because i'm not involved with any of this i'm the number one outsider of outsiders i guess in some ways that's a good place to be especially if you're going to be doing your own investigation about this world this crazy world that we live in you know maybe it's not such a bad idea to be the outsider you know what i mean after all it seems to be human nature across the board that we uh like we're, we're all a bunch of bullshit artists is what we are so it's very difficult to uh assess the truth or not i mean i've seen things i've experienced things i've filmed things something's going on <clears throat> And it seems to be more in, in line with what the spiritualists and uh, the Native Americans and their, uh, or I should say, First Nations people in North America, what they have to say. It seems maybe in line with a little bit with the Tibetan monks. I don't know. I can't trust anything with what the Abrahamic faith say. I'm sorry to disappoint you people. I just offended, you know, 60% of the world by saying that, but I'm sorry your books the Bible in particular, the Old and New Testament. <sighs> I can't believe I wasted a whole decade over my, of my life studying and that only to find out there's all BS. Anyways, so what's the difference? If you waste all the time doing that and find out it's BS, let's find out something else is BS. You know, that's one of the fascinating things about life is, is the more and more I study about things, the one thing I'm learning and what I know is what I don't know. That most things are just plain old freaking bullshit. We make up stuff. I mean, that's our that's the double-edged source of humanity. Our brilliance and our imagination. And, and, I'm, and I'm just saying it the way it is. I mean, people, I wish I was as brilliant with imagination as a lot of you people are. Some of you are amazing. Some of you are so amazing you can write Harry Potter novels and freaking sell billions of them and become a billionaire. And, you know... You know, what do you do about all this? Do you embrace and accept the fact that that's who we are? And, um, you know, we're just a bunch of clothed bonobos who have a good time um, bullshitting each other. That's where it seems pretty negative, but I think it's to be the case. Repressed, oppressed of bonobos. Well, part of the problem is women get pregnant so easily. Jeez. If they wouldn't get so pregnant so easily, then you know what? Then uh, I think a whole bunch of you would actually start behaving even more like bonobos, for better or worse. That's for me. Ugh. I don't want to deal with all the madness. I just want to understand why and the, what the fuck is this place? This Fortean freaking nightmare of a place. What the hell are we living in? I, it's, too, it's too much to ask to know what the truth is about anything outside of the fact that the truth is is that everybody's designing shit to kill each other and <laughs> and lie to each other. I mean, seriously. And we all walk around like our shit doesn't smell and it's amazing. Shockingly amazing. <clears throat> I 
I mean, is the internet going to end up being basically after hours? You know, maybe when you're young, maybe you're at that age. You know, uh, I, I don't know what the uh, bar scene is like. I haven't been to the bar scene in, in quite a while. It's been 20 years. I mean, the last time I actually played in a bar was 2009 uh, when I was playing the bass. So, and I didn't like it then, and I don't dig it. I mean, the only reason people went there anyways is to get drunk and get laid, right? Pretend to like the music talk to the bartender I remember the bar the last time I played was the guy who was a waiter who worked there too he had no legs and he used a skateboard he's getting around and I'm like wow amazing resilient human being he was my point in all this is is that you know does it seem like the, the when we look at TikTok uh, and apps like that and um it's like a giant after hour party. So if you're young and say you were you're in college and you were watching your bands and then afterwards you stuck around, maybe you knew the bartender or the, man, the manager or the owner and they allowed you to stick around and gave you a few beers and all and you listened to the stupid conversations between waiters and waiters, waitresses and uh, bartenders and all that. And it's, it's, it's like the same thing going on. It's just a new version of the after hours party. Which I guess we need all to have that, right? We need some way to unloosen and just say stupid crap, right? We all need to do it. And the thing is, is that understanding that we all need to say that, we can count on the fact that we can't count much on each other as far as telling the truth overall. Especially when the group gets together. Individually, one-on-one, -on -one, it seems to be, be a little bit different, especially if you're able to just have enough courage to ask the questions, right? Knowing full well that that person is probably going to get offended for you just asking the questions, but it's the only way to get closer to the truth. The more I do this stuff, the more I realize how little I know. I'm no smarter than I was when I was five years old. In fact, I think that I am. I was smarter back then than I am today. So for half a century, I spent my time in this uh, giant prison, this giant Fortean uh, prison pl planet. And you know what? What the hell am I? I mean, any closer to any truth except that the truth is is that constantly being told not the truth. Sorry about this. Sorry about this rant. I totally lost focus again. So it's easy, especially when you read this stuff. But you know, I think it's important. At least it's important to me. It might not be important to you guys, and I understand if it's not important to anybody. But I need to do this, and the reason I read this stuff out loud because I'm playing make believe. Because you know, there's nobody to really, you know, I could read this stuff, but then who do I talk to about this stuff? There's no one to talk to about any of this stuff. And when you do talk about this stuff with people who are into UFOs and all that, they're so entrenched in the cult mentality that you can't fucking have this conversation. And they're, uh, you know, everyone seems to have to take a side. It's like a religion. Everyone has to take a side, except, you know, why don't we just, like, have an honest discussion and come to a truth? Is it that impossible? Maybe it really is. And if that's the case about this place that we can't come to the truth much about anything, what kind of fucking place is this? We have no way of knowing how many sightings went unreported, blah, 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 blah. So it says, probably analyze what little hard data that we have. And this is the emphasis on this. we analyzing, and this is back then 50 years ago, and we're no better off today uh, as far as it was 50 years ago. Little hard data is available. Yet people are seeing stuff. And yet you, there's drones, there's planes, there's the hallucinations. And then some of us actually do fucking see something. Something pops into their reality for a short time or a long period of time or whatever. I've seen stuff. And boy, do I wish I could have used the excuse that I was on drugs. But I wasn't. And the stuff that I've seen, I'm sorry, 
Christianity is not going to help. The Abrahamic religion aren't going to help. It seems like none of the organized religions can help. And nor does the scientific community want to help. Nor does anybody want to help. Except everyone wants to make a name for themselves. It's all what's more important is to have 100,000 viewers than it is to actually speak and talk about the truth about anything. If the newspapers in 1897 had, had not been willing to ridicule the sightings and the ciders and had not indulged in devising nonsensical and misleading sightings of their own, we might have been able to untangle some of these the sooner. There was no one crying censorship in 1897, yet many skeptical editors probably chose to ignore the phenomenon altogether, just as many of our modern counterparts do. A great cigarette equipped, a great cigar equipped with a powerful beacon is supposed to have passed over uh, Cicerville, West Virginia, on April 19th, 1897, but when I visited Sisterville in, 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 1980, in 1967, I learned to my dismay that the old newspaper office and all of its files had been destroyed by fire in the early 1950s. Incidentally, many of the 1897 reports referred to powerful beacons and searchlights with which the objects uh, uh, sprayed blinding light over the ground they passed. This is still another um, thing that turns up repeatedly in modern UFO reports. And it says here, flying officers, flying saucers were still being seen regularly in Sisterville in uh, 1966-1967. The town's leading attorney, Robert Wright, told me, we've been seeing these things for months. In fact, since last summer, they've been showing up here almost every Wednesday like clockwork. Everybody's been watching them, but... Not everybody likes to talk about them. On one, one Wednesday, a few weeks back, my wife and I watched one of these things. <clears throat> Nay. One of these things for, our, for an hour or just over the, that hill. He pointed to a high ridge visible from his office window. Then it seemed to split into three, and all three of them took off like a herd of turtles. What? Characteristically, the local press had not commented on the numerous sightings. I do not doubt that someone has carefully flied it was carefully flying over the United States in 1897, paying great attention to special isolated areas. We can lay out on the map the actual course of some of these objects and find that they often flew in almost straight lines over several towns on a given night until they reached a place where a landing was later reported. Meteorites and swamp gas don't fit into these patterns, but neither do the Martians and Venetians. Whoever was involved in this, these activities, these activities, knew price precisely what they were doing, and they set up a careful smoke screen to cover their real activities. They're an engineered much of the ridicule, confusion, and disbelief that followed in their wake. By applying the techniques of what we now call psychological warfare, they managed to deceive a whole generation, and they're still doing it.
Yes, sir. Okay, patterns of deception. The operators of the wonderful 1896 airships followed a careful plan which becomes transparent now that we are able to apply hindsight to the huge pile of newspaper reports. Here is the summer, here's a summary of the staged events pieced together from <clears throat> the many newspaper clippings of the period. Early in November of 1896, before the California airship excitement had erupted, an impressive uh, stranger visited the office of a prominent attorney in San Francisco named George D. Collins. This man, never identified in the numerous newspaper accounts, told Collins that he was the inventor of a marvelous new airship which operated on compressed air. He asked Collins to represent him and help him to obtain a patent. The lawyer was shown detailed drawings of the invention and was duly impressed. The mystery, mystery man seemed intelligent and articulate and appeared to be in his late 40s. Was a dark complexion, was of dark complexion, dark eyed and about 5 foot 7 in height and weighed about 140 pounds. He was described as being very well dressed and projected an aura of wealth. <clears throat> A few days after the first airship sightings hit the San Francisco newspapers, Collins told reporters that he had met the inventor of the craft and that he knew all about the airship. Reporters were unable to locate the mystery man. However, he soon visited an even better known legal advisor, one William Henry Harrison Hart who had once run for office of the state attorney general. Soon after the flap uh, peaked, a, a statement signed by Hart appeared on page one of the San Francisco Call, Sunday, November 29, 1896. Uh, I have not seen it the airship personally but have talked with the man who claims to have to be the inventor i have spent several hours with him he has showed me his drawings and diagrams of his invention and i'm convinced that they are more um, adapt for the purpose for which he claims them uh, than any other invention making such claims that i have ever seen da -da -da -da, i asked the gentleman who claims to be the inventor, what he desires were in regards to carrying on the business, and he stated that he did not desire any money, that he didn't ask or want anyone to invest in it, that he was not a citizen of California, and that he had come here to perfect and test his airship. Da -da -da. I will admit that this is the first time, to my knowledge, that anybody had anything in California in which he did not want anyone to invest money. According to Hart, the invention operated on gas and electricity, and the inventor expressed interest in using his machine to fly to Cuba and drive out the Spaniards. Some of the local newspapers apparently misquoted both Collins and Hart badly, and this probably led to Hart's uh, issuance of a signed statement. By the end of November, Collins was so disgusted with that he refused to see reporters or discuss the matter further. I can understand that, man. It sounds like TikTok today. The mysterious investors had managed a single single out of two of the most respected men in California. They had, in good faith, 
served as his spokesman and their reports were widely circulated. The flap of the that Thanksgiving week supported their stories but the inventor never came forward to enjoy his triumph. He simply vanished after the sightings subsided. The description of the mystery man dark complected, dark eyed, slight in, in stature bears a remarkable resemblance to a numerous descriptions of the air shift occupants as published five months later during the wave of April 1897. Also witnesses of some of the 1897 landings claimed that the occupants discussed the situation in Cuba. Some of the minor discrepancies in the published stories of Hart and Collins may have been journalistic errors or may have been based on undes understandable misinterpretations of the technical data offered by the inventor. Collins thought the object operated on compressed air while Hart said they ran on gas and compressed air. I'm going to borrow this again. Oh, this is a and electricity, compressed air and electricity. Compressed air was a favorite with inventors in those days. Gasoline and steam engines and electric motors were primitive, heavy, and inefficient. A few years previous, one man, um, One man, John Keeley of Philadelphia, had built a strange contraption which could bend bars of steel and do other things considered impossible for ordinary machines of the period. Detractors claimed that the Keeley engine really operated on compressed air. Actually, compressed air motors require large, heavy tanks uh, and pumps spent their energy very quickly and would be completely impractical for the use of any flying machine um, where weight was an important consideration. The only effective use of compressed air was in World War I, torpedoes which had to travel relatively short distances and were expendable. A summary of the mystery inventor Affair appears in Mysteries of the Sky, UFO, and Perspective by Gordon I. R. I think it's I. Uh, Gordon I. R. Lore, Lore and Harold H. Uh, uh, Denault Jr. UFO historian Lucius Ferris. Uh, has uncovered hundreds of other clippings and reports. When all of this material is carefully studied, it seems to retro in retrospect that the inventor was actually some kind of front man for the phenomenon and that he had prior knowledge of the impending flap. He therefore planted his airship story convincingly with Collins and Hart knowing that they their reputations would carry it a long way. It did seem like a reasonable explanation for the sightings which occurred, even though none of the witnesses reported an object which fitted Collins' description of a winged aluminum craft exactly. As I have already pointed out, the frequency and distribution of the sightings indicated several objects were actually operating in operation at the time. <clears throat> in hundreds of modern UFO events, we have repetitions of this tactic, which I call pressed agent game. Uh, once again, press agent game. In these events, small, dark-skinned, dark-eyed gentlemen appear in an area immediately before and immediately after the flying saucer flap. 
these cases are not widely known and have been poorly investigated because of the hardcore cultists who have found it impossible to reconcile such seemingly normal beings with extraterrestrial visitants. Striking examples of press agent game can be found in their religious and occult lore going back thousands of years. Weeks before the birth of Christ, three dark-skinned men with oriental features arrived in King Herod's court. They were obviously men of wealth and breeding and just like other mysterious inventors and the various records say that they <clears throat> generated great excitement with their revelation that a very special child would soon be born somewhere in Judea. By making this appearance before King Herod and spreading the story, they made certain that the impending birth would be recorded in the court records and preserved for the ages. After successfully carrying out this mission, the trio from the east proceeded to Bethlehem where they created another stir and focused attention on the Christ child. Then instead of returning to King Herod to report, they had, as they had promised, they went home by another way. If these men had come from India or even further away, it would have taken them many months and even years to travel by sea or land to Jerusalem. This would have taken considerable planning and expense and would have demanded that they have advanced knowledge of the event. If they had been mortal men, they would almost certainly have created a similar stir when they arrived home in India or wherever, and it is likely that some written records of their story would have preserved would have been preserved there seems to be no such record because there is none it's made up like our mysterious mystery inventor they appeared in the area of the action prior to the event they visited the most important personages they could find and they circulated their story and then they vanished our ufo mystery men usually travel in threes also and have become popularly known as the three men in black. They usually wear somber clothing and have olive complexion and in most cases high cheekbones and oriental eyes. According to Hart, and the 1896 inventor had three assistants with him, all of whom were mechanics. The secret inventor was a tremendously successful ploy in 1896 and it was reused again with many added embellishments in 1897. The story was carefully sustained through the series of landings and occasional planted messages. Saturday, April 17, 1897, two boys were playing in Chicago Lincoln Park when they were spotted at when they spotted a package wrapped in brown paper resting high in the limbs of a tree. Daniel J. Shorter, 12, shined up, shimmed up the tree and retrieved it. And when they unwrapped their, their prize, they found a, plast, a past, uh, passport box. A pasteboard box, that's what it is, containing the remnants of a luncheon and attached to the box there was a beautifully engraved card on which was printed the following inscription dropped from airship Sar Saratoga airship Saratoga uh, Friday April 16 1897 the card was folded and had an embellished front page. In the upper corner were printed the words airship and below them was a gilded ensign ins of a boy standing on a pair of outstretched wings. 
It was made of fine cardboard and looked expensive. Besides uh, the printed words of the first page, this memo was written in blue pencil in the, in the inside. Uh, 9.41 p.m. In due northwest, 2,000 feet, 61 north latitude, 33, 30, there is 33 longitude. Descending, dense fog and uh, drizzling spuds, spuds, odd spuds. Uh, if this message was not a complete hoax, these figures would have placed a the Saratoga over Greenland. <clears throat> the Sioux Falls, South Dakota. August leader commented, hopefully in, uh, on April 21st, there were no names or other useful information on the card, but it is expected that by it, the persons operating the aerial navigation scheme may be located. The lunchbox was either dropped from the airship or, and lodged in the branches of the tree or was placed there to hoax people. Many people looked at this strange find yesterday and it was not generally denounced as a hoax because uh, of some of the observing men pointed out that anyone who had fancy airship cards printed was going to unnecessary going to unnecessary expense to carry out a joke while the package uh, could just as well have been placed in some busy thoroughfare. Who indeed would go to such elaborate lengths to pull off another airship joke? Perhaps the Chicago prankster, if a prankster was responsible, was trying to outdo another prankster in Appleton, Wisconsin, who had planted a similar note only two days before. The Grand Rapids, Michigan Evening Press of April 16, 1897 carried this article. Appleton, Wisconsin, April 15, many persons in this city declare that they saw an airship pass over the city last Sunday night, at the last night of and the last night on the farm of N.B. Clark, in north of the city, a letter was picked up. <coughs> Did I say the? So last night on the farm of N.B. Clark, north of the city, a letter was picked up and attached to an iron rod, 18 inches long, uh, sticking in the ground. The letter which was not signed is as follows. Aboard the airship Pegasus, of course. In uh, April 9, 1897, the problem of aerial navigation has been solved. The writers have spent their past month uh, cruising uh, above in the airship Pegasus and have demonstrated that to their entire satisfaction that the ship is a thorough success. And, and it says um, Greenland is the world's only source of natural uh, chrysolite, important in the manufacture of aluminum, a substance which plays an important role in UFO mystery. Okay. Uh, the Pegasus was erected at the at a secluded point 10 miles from Lafayette, Tennessee. Does every damn state have a Lafayette in it as well? And the various parts of the machines were carried overland from Glasgow, Kentucky, uh, to the, that point being shipped from Chicago, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. We have made regular trips of three days each from Lafayette to uh, Yacon, Yukon, Yacon, uh, and no harm has come to the Pegasus thus far. R within a month, our application for the patents for the for a parallel plane air plan, pl 
plane, plane, airplane, plane, <laughs> plane, um, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Within a month, our uh, app application for the app patents for a parallel plane airship plan, 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 plan airship will be fill, filed simultaneously at Washington and the European capitals. The ship is propelled by steam and is lighted by electricity and has a carrying power of 1,000 pounds, which is that's not very much. So now there were two airships, the notable the noble Pegasus and the Saratoga. This second note confirms what the contactees claimed they were being told, that it was a secret invention and soon patents would be filed and the whole world would know. Every, even today it would be difficult to build a steam-powered uh, lighter-than-air craft. For steam you need lots of water. Well, apparently the airship crews were draining wells all around the country, but you also need lots of fuel, heavy coal or wood uh, with which to heat the water. If your airship can lift only a thousand pounds, you wouldn't be able to carry much either. No, the story has the smell of dead fish to it. The very day after the Grand Rapids Evening Press published the above, a new message from the airship turned up in Grand Rapids. A man named C.T. Smith, uh, an employee of a furniture company who has always been considered honorable and truthful, was on his way to work at 9 or excuse me 6 15 a.m. when he found a piece of stiff wire about five inches long at one end was attached quote one of the iron com combination stoppers and bottle openers commonly used to open up beer bottles and quote apparently as a weight and on the other end, an envelope was fashioned. From the airship, travelers was uh, scrawled uh, on the outside, and it contained a piece of n n note paper bearing a new message written in purple, um, indelible pencil. It read, To whom finds this? We are 2,500 feet above the level of the sea, headed north to, at this writing, testing the airship. Afraid we are lost. We are unable to control our engine. Please notify our people. Think we are somewhere over Michigan. <clears throat> Author Arthur B. Coates, Laurel, Mississippi, C.C. C. Harris, Gulfport, Mississippi, C.W. Rich, uh, Richburg, Mississippi, uh, April 16, 1897, 9 p.m. The Grand Rapids paper added that the airship is a wonderful reality is now assured and that it passed through the vicinity of the corner of South Division and William Street is a fact that is founded upon the the most irrefutable truth proof that is apparently where the note was found. Mr. Smith, who found the letter possibly positively ever ever that he, he is not a drinking man never owned a beer stopper in his own in his life. Three of the night men employed by Wallen Leather's company are very sure they saw the airship last night. In Omaha, Nebraska, preparations were underway for large 
Trans Mississippi, Mississippi Expe Expedition. So it was only logical for the great airship inventor to bid for attention there. On April 13th, the Secretary of the Exposition received the following tidbit in his mail. To the expedition director, my identity up to this date has been unknown, but I will come to the front now, i.e., if you will guarantee me 870 square feet of space. I am the famous airship conductor, um, con constructor, excuse me, and will guarantee you positively of this fact in a week. The airship is my own invention. I am an Omaha man. I wish it to be held as an Omaha invention. It will safely carry 20 people to the heights of about 10,000 to 20,000 feet. I truly believe I have the greatest invention and discovery ever made. We'll see you April 17, 1897 at the, at the headquarters. Signed, A.C. Clinton. Perhaps Mr. Clinton was aboard the El Faden, an out-of-control craft that sailed over Michigan into limbo. In any case, he didn't show up on the 17th, but several UFOs and airships were busy in five states that night. Aside from the bottle openers and half-eaten lunches, a number of other odd objects were dumped by the mysterious airship pilots. A half-peeled potato fell overboard of, of uh, Atkinson, Kansas, and a Canadian newspaper dated October 5, 1896, was dropped at the feet of Daniel Gray, a farmer in Burton, Michigan. <clears throat> Gray says he had been working in his field on Friday, April the 23rd, when he heard a rumbling sound in the sky and saw a dark object rushing past. The paper fluttered down from it and was dry and well-preserved and suffered little, if any, injury in its flight from the heavens. The second of Michigan Globe, April 26, 1897. All of these things could have been simple hoaxes, of course, but in the forecoming chapters, we will describe some uneasily similar incidences that have happened in more recent years. Part of my research in the past four years has been devoted to a re-examination -examin of the alleged UFO hoaxes, and I am now convinced that many of these hoaxes were actually engineered deliberately and success successfully to discredit the UFO phenomenon. Let's review briefly some of the salient points in this chapter. One. It is obvious that a great many unidentified flying objects were present in our skies in 1897. Two, it is also obvious that they were manned by at least three different types of beings. A, normal types, some which with beards and included, including women, as reported by several of the contactees of the period, B, the Oriental type, the Japs, as reported by Judge Bryan, C, the unidentifiable creatures described by Alexander Hamilton, and three, it sounds as if some of them, the stranger types, uh, made a real effort to hide from witnesses who stumbled upon them accidentally. For the occupants of these crafts knew a great deal about us and were able to speak and possibly write our languages. If they were just fresh in, in from Mars, this would have been very unlikely. Allow me now to do some educated speculating. 
speculating based upon my experiences with more recent situations. Let us assume that an unknown group of well-organized individuals, some of them quite alien from us in appearance, speech, etc., found it expedient to conduct a large-scale survey of the Midwest United States in, 19, in 1897 by air. Since no aircraft existed in the United States at that time, they knew that they might attract undue attention. Attention was the one thing they didn't want. They didn't want us even to know that they existed, and if we became conscious of their aircraft, we would automatically become aware of them. So they had to devise a plan by which, to, by which this invasion would go relatively unnoticed, or at least seem harmless. In 1897, everyone had at least heard of a lighter than aircraft. Crude at dirigibles had already been f flown in Europe, and pictures and drawings had appeared in American newspapers and magazines. So the obvious ploy for people I call ultra-terrestrials would be to construct a few craft that at least resembled dirigibles and make sure that they were seen in several places by many people such as Chicago. These decoys would get a lot of publicity and from then on everything that anyone saw in the sky would be classified as airship. Even if it were uh, shaped like a donut, like a donut, and had a big hole in the middle. Such a plan had to go further. However, since the aerial activity um, was going to be most intense in some areas, some kind of explanation for the mystery, for the mystery airship ship had to be intent had to be tendered this could best be done by staging deliberate landings in relatively remote places and contacting a few random individuals telling them the secret invention story and letting them spread the word to add support to it notes would be dropped occasionally confirming what the contactees were saying, and even a few ordinary artifacts such as high peeled potatoes, or excuse me, half peeled to pay, to, to half peeled potatoes and foreign newspapers would be added in the stew, since some or maybe most of the ultra terrestrials look very much like us, they would be assigned to man the decoys and the other objects, the real vehicles to be employed in this operation would carefully remain aloft. To lend further confusion to the situation, some of the contactees would be told ridiculous things which would discredit not only them but the whole mystery. Knowing how we think and how we search for consistencies, the ultra-terrestrials ultra were careful to show inconsistencies in, the wake, in their wake. They staged some outrageous stunts such as singing loudly as they flew over Farmer, Farmersville, Texas on April 19th and played the phonograph or other instruments over of uh, Fountain, Fountainell, uh, uh, Iowa, on April 12th, when the the startled Stones people reported hearing uh, an orchestra playing in the sky. Newspapers whooped and heaped ridicules on the story. Was there an airship or wasn't there? Thousands saw it and make and became convinced, but millions read all of these conflicting tales and remained skeptical. Obviously, to the uninformed reader in 1897, there were only one airship, and, and it was exper experimental. 
it was always breaking down somewhere but what are were those great multi lights uh, forms hurling back and forth across the sky every night oh just the air airship where were they going where were they coming from well they were built by a secret inventor in Nebraska or Tennessee or Iowa or Boston take your pick the inventor kept his secret well he never filed for his patents like a gentleman he waited until Count Zeppelin <clears throat> took off in his first rigged airship in July of 19 uh, July 2nd 1900 and flew three and a half miles at 18 miles per hour before his steering gear failed recently a great British uh, authority uh, Clark excuse me Charles H Gibbs ah, Gibbs another Gibbs Smith M A F M A stated quote speaking as an aeronautical historian who specializes in the period before 1910 I can say with certainty that the only airborne vehicle carrying passengers which could possibly have been seen anywhere in North America in 1897 were free spherical balloons and it is highly unlikely for these to be mistaken for anything else no form of dirigible i.e. gas powered propelled by an air screw or heavier than air flying machine was flying or indeed could fly at this time in America but if there was no secret inventor and if there was no such thing as an unidentified flying object then who or what was buzzing Eldora uh, Iowa I think I called it early Eldora but it was Eldora uh, Iowa in 1897 and why have they chosen to go back there again and again ever since if I lived in Eldora I'd sure as hell demand that somebody find out and that is the end of that chapter the next chapter is flexible phantoms in the sky and then the name of that previous chapter was the grand deception and of course the book is why the ufos why ufos operation trojan horse by john a kill interesting read a lot to be revealed not much has changed in 126 years that's a 